One more question. Was One this more. the best Tour de France you ever watched? I'm 12, so I haven't watched many, but it was. It was. And that was because GC was just every day. I swear there was something on GC, even on the stages like Morgin and Mejev. Like I had them booked in, swift ride, late lunch, maybe even go out to lunch with my wife. Nah. But this show, as always, is brought to you by Zwift, whether you're just starting out on your cycling journey or are looking for those final tune-ups ahead of a big event or race. Zwift is the online cycling platform that makes things fun, as well as being the name sponsor of the Tour de France firm, Avec Zwift, and this podcast. If you want to find out more about Zwift, the platform, the race, go to Zwift.com, and if you want to try it out, you can get a free seven-day trial it was like UAE pacing, big fight for the break. It was like, I can't wait for the Vuelta where I see. I just can't wait for Burgos, uh, Keeper, Kern Farmer <laughs> to get in the break. Two guys on flat station. I'm like, yes, fuck yes, yes. They <laughs> <laughs> come back in three hours. We never had that. Even while going solo on stage, like, you had to still watch. So, yeah, it was incredible. Like, I remember so many of the stages were memorable. Grenon was a crazy stage. Alpe d'Huez, that was the only kind of stalemate one. But then even the Pyrenees, like, Pagatcha just went all in for the win and just made it super entertaining uh uae on perigude even even the foie state even the uh, murder pagu stage 16 benji nothing happened in the end but the tension before there it could have exploded one bit of weakness from vingegaard or, or pagacha they got satellite riders and suddenly big time like the tension was really really good whereas the opposite to the giro where no big gaps are happening no big gaps are happening not too much three guys together 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 final climb Healy goes, takes time, to uh, Jira's over. Like, it, it, you know, there wasn't actually the tension. Like, remember during that final Jira stage, it was like, this is shit, and it was boring. And then he just was the test done. This tour was kind of the opposite with wall-to-wall action. So my answer is yes. Sorry, that was a very long way of saying yes. Good. I like the answer. I think when it comes to me, I was kind of like, when the Tour de France started, I was like, okay, these first three Danish stages, the public's amazing. We had a first time trial with the weather kind of deciding the victor a bit, which I'm never a fan of when it comes to time trials. So I was kind of a bit like meh about it, even though it's Lampard, awesome guy, really happy that he won. His interview was amazing, really honest and so forth. So I love that. But the first eight stages of the last year's Grand Tour are a perfect Grand Tour in itself for me. But then it became boring because it was so obvious that Pogaccio was winning after the first eight stages last year. But the first three stages of last year's Grand Tour were more memorable to me than the first three of this year's Grand Tour. Van der Poel with Mur de Bretagne, the yellow oh, jersey yeah. for Pulidor, Alaphilippe on the first stage in World Championships jersey. That's awesome to me, those first three stages. These three first stages in Denmark were a bit meh, in my personal opinion. They were. But then it started tuning up. It started tuning up. We had three Wout van Aert second place in those first three stages. And having him do that crazy stuff on that Calais finish, like that was pretty amazing to watch. Let's be honest about it. That kind of kicked off the Tour de France for me. And that's when it started coming stage by stage by stage by stage, just continuously action, 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 action. And I think in the end of this the most crazy Tour de France I've watched because even on the flat stages, Pogaccio was attacking into the breakaway sometimes. And that's something you wouldn't see in the Froome days. Bardet was not doing that against Froome in 2017, as my guess, 2016, whatever. The year they had Peragut as well, where Bardet won. Like, we we seen so much action throughout this Grand Tour on stage that we didn't expect it either. I'd say this is probably the best Grand Tour I've ever watched, although there's probably some recency bias in there. I'm a, a person that is often biased to recent events. If a, a rider wins the most recent race, I will probably rate them higher than someone who won that exact race a year ago. Yeah, but... Ramco is winning the Vuelta because he won <laughs> San Sebastian. I told you this already. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's my point. <laughs> no, nah, like, is that... It's the best one we've ever done since starting the podcast. Yeah. Well... Is it? No, because tw- no, 2020 was not the best overall race. It maybe had the most crazy finish, Yeah, and it, but, but I don't think best overall race. I did mention once on the podcast, the finish of a Grand Tour is very vital to how I rate them 
in my rankings when it comes to the years. 2016 Giro was dog shit for me because I'm an Ibley fan. The dude's losing 17 decades on a time trial in a mountain time trial against Stevie Squareway. So that's pretty damn sad. And in the end, in the last week, it all turns around. Yes, I'm a hardcore Nibali fan, so I'm very happy that the events unfolded like they did. It's very unfortunate for Steven, of course, for Steven Kruiswijk on that and Esteban. ice wall. Esteban, well, yeah, I never really Mikey saw Shane him as... should have won. Nah, nah. Vincenzo Nibali, goat. Absolute goat. But <laughs> I don't, were you, did you not... Could you have not watched the TT this year? I still <laughs> had to watch it, you know, because of, of 2020. I can't... I know mathematically I was like, Pagacha cannot do anything. And after out of game, he couldn't, but I still was like... I still got to watch this TT. Ah, I don't know I, what's going to happen. I didn't believe Pogaccio was going to win after Paragud. Paragud was like, because like even in the worst possible scenario where Vingago was so isolated that UAE was at their strongest, it was Vingago able to follow Pogaccio and even contest for the stage win in Paragud, for example. And when you're that strong that you can take that competition on at your weakest team-wise, then I was not scared of what's about to come in the coming uh few days except for a crash or puncture but hey what there's nothing we can do about that there that happens so i i well, never tried can. to think you about can that you not follow not follow pagacha doing threat of death down the bandels <laughs> and you cannot try and break the descent kom into rockamador and the tt so i disagree there are a few <laughs> things so that's why i had to watch because Jonas was like i want to win by five minutes it looked like to me um <laughs> I made it entertaining. But yeah, it was the best one. I think we've definitely covered on the podcast. One of the best I've ever watched. And just very aggressive racing. I think that was Yumbo team being aggressive. And then oh, gotcha. you're coming up against a one man a one man wrecking ball. Oh, that's unfair actually. So um McNulty and Bjerg made stage seventeen. Yeah. Um, but otherwise he was, you know, always attacking. 